those days, and we have with us the head of opposition, don't think that we did not try to get people from the government. <coughs> but we were not successful. And the head of opposition was a friend of ours. Uh, really, it's an honor for us to have you here. General of Israel, Advocate Yitzhak Herzog, a TV advocate, leader of the opposition, Justice Eliakim Rubinstein, Deputy President of the Supreme Court of Israel, judges, members of the association, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored to open the 16th Congress of the International Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists, the subject of which is Jerusalem, thus this city is a natural choice the International Association of Jewish Lawyers and Juries has had many conferences in the past. The World Congress means that in addition to the conference, at this gathering, the association will hold election for the president and the board. The period during which we are holding this congress is very significant from an historical point of view. We are marking the publication of the Balfour Declaration 100 years ago, this month. Our association had a conference on this subject with the UK lawyers of for Israel over a month ago in London. We should remember that the final version of the declaration was reduced in scope and size from the proposal submitted by Chaim Weizmann, but did include the recognition of the national home for the Jews in Eretz Israel at the time. The 1922 mandate document written by the League of Nations ratified the decisions of the San Remo Conference, which include the Balfour Declaration. The result of this a ratification gave the declaration international legal standing. One might see the declaration as a preamble to the birth of the State of Israel, as it is mentioned in Israel Declaration of Independence, However, there are numerous interpretations as to the meaning of the declaration on, for example, a few following questions. What was the background at the time of the First World War that caused this declaration? What were the interests of the different powers in relation to the declaration? What was the role of Heinz Weizmann at the time? What is the, pers what is the perspective today concerning the result of the declaration? The relevance of the declaration is political, legal and moral. Interpretation of these aspects can be found in numerous lectures and articles dealing with the declaration and no doubt that the last word has yet to be spoken. Significantly, on this very day, 70 years ago, November 29, 1947, the UN General, General Assembly voted in favor of a resolution which adopted the plan for the partition of Palestine recommended by the majority of the UN Special Committee on Palestine, UNSCO, 33 states voted in favor of the resolution and 13 against. 10 states abstained. UNSCO had been appointed seven months earlier after Great Britain, which ruled the country on the basis of a League of Nations mandate, decided that in light of the growing Jewish resistance and violent opposition to its rule, it was unwilling to continue on the existing basis and handed the whole issue over to the United Nations. The United Nations Committee reached the conclusion that the mandate for Palestine should be terminated and most of the members recommended the establishment in territory of mandatory Palestine of an Arab state and a Jewish state while internationalizing Jerusalem. The partition made proposed by UNSCO allotted the Jewish state only a small part of Western Palestine. Despite this fact, the Zionist organization and the institution of the Jewish community in Eretz Israel agreed to accept the plan, since it recognized the right of the Jewish people to a state and not only a national home, as stated in the 1917 Balfour Declaration and the 1922 Mandate for Palestine. <coughs> The adoption of the partition resolution by the General Assembly was received by the Jewish community with great joy and thousands went out to the streets to celebrate 
even though it was clear that the Arab states and the Palestinian Arabs would embark on a relentless war against the realization of the plan to establish a Jewish state. Today, we are celebrating 70 years since the partition plan, and Israel will celebrate its 17th birthday next year. Historically, important is also the speech of Anwar Sadat, president of Egypt before the Knesset 40 years ago, this month, which led to the peace agreement with Egypt. In addition, one week ago today, marked 50 years since the adoption of the UN Resolution 242. We decided that Jerusalem would be the subject of our Congress for a number of reasons. First, this year, 2017, marks 50 years of United Jerusalem. Our lectures will relate to the question whether this goal was achieved in reality. Second, Jerusalem's position as a holy city for the Jews, Christians, and Muslims in the two-state solution is very meaningful and problematic, as we all know. And it will be very interesting to hear different views and to be able to discuss various positions. As we all know, according to the partition resolution, <coughs> Jerusalem was to be a corpus separatum under a special international regime to be administered by the UN. It is interesting to note that Israel's declaration of independence does not mention Jerusalem. One of the reasons might be that in the partition decision, Jerusalem was given a special status and the provisional council of the state did not want at that time to contradict the text of the partition resolution. We will try to relate to those subjects and others during our conference, and I trust that it will be most interesting and stimulating. From a personal point of view, as I mentioned, we will hold elections for the different bodies of our association at this Congress. A few months ago, I announced that I would be stepping down from the presidency after seven years of full devotion to the association. It is very close to my heart, and I believe that it is very important organization. As the late Mayor Rosen that we all miss used to say, Irit, the sky is the limit. I hope that the next president will adopt this vision, and I promise to help. During my tenure, I used to cite our founders, René Kassin, Arthur Goldberg, and Chaim Cohen, we indicated in the first meeting of the establishment of the association that the organization is a human rights association for all mankind. Our activities were not only to fight anti-Semitism as an NGO that has accreditation in the United Nations, we exposed and dealt with various violations of human rights. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are witnessing today different forms of anti-Semitism all over the world, and there is much work to be done in this area alone. Time will not permit me to elaborate on our achievements during the presiding years, but all of our activities are detailed on our site. The period in which we are living today is turbulent, even revolutionary. We are witnessing major changes in geopolitics, societies, the electorate, terrorism, etc. A world in flux is kept spinning by social media and the internet, which has become a welcome tool in our everyday lives, but has revealed itself as a double-edged sword. The significant increase in anti-Semitism demands the association's attention alongside general violation of human rights, and I'm sure that we continue to be active in these areas. I would like to take these opportunities to thank our executive board, Nala Tavori, the editor of the magazine, Justice Magazine, Iris Zilberman, who is not here but will be here tomorrow, our dedicated and faithful office manager, and last but not least, where is Yoni? Come here. Pleasure to work. I wish you all a very successful conference.